Hello, welcome to the second uh, YouTube video, Ruminations About Ableism. And today I'm going to be meeting and discussing and chatting with the fabulous Kath Duncan and uh, looking at um, discussing disability, identity, performance and ableism. Now, I asked Kath to send me some information about herself and I got a <laughs> really, really long um, description on, on my phone, which was a really interesting. But let me just tell you a few things about Kath. Kath is, and other things about her will come out as we talk, no doubt. Kath's a writer. She's a performer. She's a broadcaster, producer, and she's an artist, and she's a person with a disability. And I guess uh, in terms of today, she's produced for the ABC, but she's a founder and co-producer um, and performer for a performance in Australia known as Quippings, and she's been doing that from 2010. And uh, we'll speak about that um, as we go through the interview. So welcome, Kath. Hey, hi, Fiona. Oh, hi. Hi. See you again. Thank you. Look, I thought, um, you know, this because this uh, interview is going to be put up on on online for an international audience. I thought I'd um, context is really important, as you know, Kath. And I thought I'd step back from this a little bit and, um, firstly, uh, just to uh, explain that the issue of uh, this disability performance, whether it be theatre or stand-up comedy or indeed movies, um, in the Australian context with um, disabled people's performers is it's not like um, for example the US or the UK scene where there's been an established culture there's an established visibility so um, and I'm, I was thinking as I was preparing for this interview Kath about the first time I ever um, saw a disabled person on stage um, not just performing as a disabled person but having their content which had disability content and that probably was Steady Eddie um, oh, yeah. a stand-up comic um, with cerebral palsy and he's I think he's been doing that gig for about 25 plus years now so I mean yes. um, and then there was another fellow from what I can remember and I can't recall his name and you probably might know him um, he's an evangelical fellow who's um, oh, yeah. uh, has um, missing multiple limbs and kind of does the kind of stuff education programs for school <laughs> Balletic, or that's right. That's right. Bit of yeah. stand-up comedy, a bit of kind of, um, uh, but really drawing on, I guess, a lot of a religious sentiment. And in some ways, it, there's, I have some uneasiness about that. And I just yeah. thought we might open the conversation because I think, uh, you know, exposure and visibility is really important. We know that some um, for, for social inclusion and integration, that's absolutely vital. That we just might set the scene more broadly. Um, about, uh, I guess, your understanding, because you've been right in the thick of it, of, 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 I guess, disability performance culture and how that's taken place in Australia. I mean, what is the context and, um, uh, you know, what have you been exposed to before you got into it? Well, it's pretty much a blank slate, isn't it, Fiona? I mean, in terms of, you know, disability performance in Australia, um, we, you and I, probably know everyone that's involved and we live in this huge country with 20 million people and we probably know every single one of the people that has actually made an impact in this area. Um, for me personally, uh, I, I came into performance because when I was six and, and starting school, my parents were concerned because I, was, I physically look different and always have, they were concerned about my confidence and projection level, you know, in public and with other kids. And so I was enrolled in the local sort of speech and drama classes they were in those mm -hmm. days. So weekly we would go, me and my sisters and my brother would go just a little walk up the road and, you know, learn scripts and learn to project, learn to sing. I'm still a terrible singer. Um, and every year we would put on a performance. Now, the, the thing that was interesting for me is that I wasn't aware until I was older of how weird I was really up on stage. It just didn't sort of cross my mind. Um, and, in fact, it wasn't until... Um, after high school, I also did, you know, a fair bit of performance through my years there and I started um, joining other, like more um, uh, other groups that drew in performers, particularly teenagers from, you know, around Sydney where I grew up and it was a really salutary moment for me in one class 
we were doing, there was a person at the front doing movement and we were in this big group. There were maybe 30 or 40 of us doing the movement and I was near the front, you know, whatever. And I just felt this hand touch me and it was one of the tutors and he took me and he took me to the back of the group. So oh. we're all looking forward and I was now at the back of the group and I said, what's the problem? You know, and he goes, oh, you're distracting everybody. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he goes, well, you know, the way that you move, the way that you look. And that was kind of the – I was probably 18 or 19 and that was the first time I thought, oh, you know, I am problematic. And, of course, I've been problematic in other places, but I, I didn't think performance was like that. And, unfortunately, that trajectory was how it continued. I mean, I didn't – when was the first time I saw a disabled person up on stage? Oh, my God. I mean – uh, it probably uh, so. What I decided to do was to work in journalism instead, and, and yeah. specifically radio journalism, because you know, except for the people I was interviewing, no one could see me, and, and that worked well. And I did that for quite a few years, but never really found my disability arts niche until I was in my forties. Yeah, and I'm just thinking as we're talking, like it's uh, the the memories trickling back, and I'm thinking, uh, I mean. There's, I guess there's two issues. One is about, you know, disabled people either individually or in groups performing, and it could be about any kind of topic, not, not necessarily related to disability. And then there's the kind of political disability performance culture, which, again, we'll talk about a little bit later. But I was, as I was thinking about that, I, was, I can remember um, the New South Wales Deaf Theatre um, was around, um, very powerful, um, and um, uh, there was a, I can, there was a performance of Madame Butterfly, I think, with people with intellectual disability at the Sydney Opera House in the Aldo, Aldo Gennaro. Aldo Gennaro, that's right. Um, and again, you got examples of disabled people as performers, but performing content that's not necessarily relevant to disability. So it's, it's kind of like, well, it's, uh, it's interesting. It's, 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 it's there where the, the, the different kind of bodies are, uh, are in your face. Um, it's but then they, much to a greater or lesser degree, may not be disability performances in the sense of using that difference, in a, in a different way. The other one I was thinking of, of course, is in Victoria, um, and I don't even know if they're still going um, these days. Is um, back to back theatre? Oh yeah, huge. To have a lot of a big disability component as well in terms of um, teaching people who've been traditionally excluded to take on acting roles. Well, I think Victoria is a very interesting place. I mean, I think um, down here, via um, people that I know, Crusader Hillis and Roland Thompson, who started uh, working in disability in, in 2000 and particularly starting to build up what became the Art of Difference Festival throughout the 2000s. And what happened in Victoria um, was that we also had that festival, the regional one. I'm sorry, I'm not remembering it right now. Mm -hmm. This regional festival that's more like community arts yes of every year since year dot and when you have festivals that are specifically for nurturing you know disability arts and disabled people's talent you start to get the culture build up and so down here in victoria we have raucous an inclusive ensemble back to back mm -hmm. we've got quippings we've got weave which is an inclusive dance performance group and i think if you compare the spread of Victorian disability arts organisations who get funding, have some, you know, professional and cultural profile and who are still operating and drawing in new members, I think we beat the rest of Australia. I and I think so. it's interesting. I think so. And I think, you know, I mean, the whole funding issue is, um, is you know, an, I guess another vexed issue. And also, I guess, the whole issue of whether performance is um, moving beyond the performance is um, therapy kind of mode yes. but, yeah but I guess I wanted to move that forward then and guess because I mean the thing about the kind of work that you've been involved in um, um, and particularly with Quippings now that it's coming up to its um, well 16th year congratulations no 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 sorry no 2010 it's its sixth year sixth year so there you go I mean that's quite quite significant and obviously the, there's been changes of the guard through it but I think uh, I, and um, I'll get you to explain quippings in a minute but the thing that strikes me about quippings or anything that's similar to it is that it's not just about disabled people performing is your current your content is there really to subvert and disrupt the whole experience of disability so it's um you know in in a way for example that uh you know um women comedians who've been talking about sexism and feminism and there's some really good um 
uh, people of colour who've also kind of um, uh, used a kind of um, uh, black po politics trope. So it's a form of kind of advocacy and engagement. Um, so maybe if, you, if we can just start by talking about what Quippings is and what, what its mission is. Um, and, you know, and, and possibly that's changed over time, but I guess um, it, you're not just a bunch of crips standing up there telling a nice story. So I'm assuming it's not just... So you've moved beyond that genre to, you know, crips performing on stage. You, you've got a mission in mind? Well, we started because in 2010, which was my first year having moved to Melbourne, I was living with Crusader Hillis and Roland Thompson at Hairs and Hyenas Bookshop Cafe. And it's sort of like a, an event space as well as a bookshop and a cafe. And we were perceiving this gap in Melbourne cultural life, which was about the intersection of disability and queerness. Yeah. As we've said, there are a number of disability companies down here doing um, fantastic work, but it is the sort of work that's open to everyone, whereas we wanted to create this adult-only space. Yeah. The, the key um, people at the beginning of Quippings were myself, Crusader Hillis, and then a man called Greg Axton. Now, Greg is a, is a lifetime wheelchair user and his, <laughs> his main drive was to be able to get into sex on premises clubs. Yeah. yeah. And he was like, activism, activism. And yeah. I was like, art, art. And Crusader was like, anything, anything. <laughs> and being the three of us, I decided logging activating thingy wasn't really my job. You know, I don't really want to be involved in the revolution unless there's some big art display going on. You know yeah. what I mean? So essentially it started because we as disabled people and Crusader is kind of one of those in-betweenish kind of ally kind of people realised that we didn't have the space to express the sort of joys, frustrations, annoyances, deaths and horror, you, you name it, within queer life as disabled people. So that's where it started and we had our first show at the very beginning of 2011. So it took us kind of six months to work out mm -hmm. what we were doing and then we took off and um, we started just with one show in the year and then it became two and then it became three and then it became eight and at the moment it's seven and it's sort of we got funding in our second year because we perceived that not only did we have a unique sort of fresh idea here, and most of it was very much adult-only content um, to begin with, but that funders wanted it too. And that was something I wasn't expecting because over the same period of time, you might argue that um, Australian, even the most mainstream, you know, opera house, arts house down here in Melbourne, so forth and so on, even the biggest companies were, were sitting back and thinking, we're not getting disabled audiences in here. You know, we're not. And then the report, picture this, oh, I can't remember the name of it, but anyway, mm -hmm. specified that um, across the, the Australian population, 38% um, of all um, adult Australians were attending, you know, various arts events, but only 25% of disabled people were. And so there was this actual noticeable gap there. And so at the same time as we're doing this, most other venues and arts organisations were working out that they weren't dealing, they weren't, um, what do you call that, catering for this yeah. population. So when we said, well, we're going to have Auslan interpreters for, you know, um, not all the shows because it's really quite expensive, but, you know, certain shows across the year that we would publicise, we were saying, well, we're not only just, you know, opening up this space for disabled people, we we're opening up this space for deaf people as well. And that's been a real selling point, which is really interesting. Um, so the, the sort of, you might say, the marginalised place I in particular was coming from as a, you know, wannabe performer all my life, I was starting to see, finally that these differences were my strengths. So, so then I guess there's a couple of things there. So in terms of the Quipping's performance, is the mission to um, educate people that, about disability or is it to kind of drive particular kind of wedges or, I mean, the, the kind of squirm, kind of subverting, kind of making people feel uncomfortable? Um, and sometimes that happens with performances where, you know, people don't know when to laugh or, or you know, or, or it's a different kind of insight. What kind of, so I guess, 
you mentioned, so it's inclusive in a sense that the audience is the general public, but also obviously, is it, it, do you want to also be there to be kind of a voice or a space for people with disabilities to interact? Do the audience interact with you? You know, all, all those, that's a really good question and I think we're still working that out. Uh, is our material there to make people uncomfortable? Yes, sometimes it is. And particularly, I might say, my material. Um, of the <laughs> other group, there are, less, there's, there are others of us because the group is kind of, expanded and contracted over time so yeah. at the moment we have about 30 performers not all of whom are involved in our next show so at any one time for a, a big series of shows that we're going into we've got a pool of about 20 people you might say not all of whom will do it but um there i've always thought that we were there for ourselves that in a, like what the way that i see it is it's a professionalization of people who are disabled performers who identify as deaf or disabled um, and because there are no other opportunities yeah. to um, extend, stretch, learn how to be a performer, how to dress, how to do makeup, just, you know, even just those really basic things. For me, that's what we're there for and I'm really glad the audience has turned up to watch. But for others, it's, it's different because, like, um, and I guess one of the beauties about Quippings is, I didn't want there to be the correct line. I wanted there to be space for everybody, no matter where they are in their disability journey. And believe me, we're all at very different places in this. For people to be able to get up and also be able to say what I would never say, stuff like, I hate my disability and life is completely awful. Yeah. And that's okay for someone to say that. Um, uh, similarly, there's a few people in the group who I think whose aspiration is to educate the audience about, if not their individual situation, then the broader situation of right. different ableism and so right. forth. Right. So kind of a bit of a multiplicity of purpose. Um, for me, I would just be happy for all of us to have a really good time, make really great art, totally enjoy it. But um, I know others, it's more complicated than that. Yeah. And it sounds like, I mean, that, and that's good. It's kind of obviously elastic enough to take in all those different kind of um, forces at play. I mean, uh, it's interesting with Crippings whether, um, you know, if you're seeing it as kind of a vehicle for, um, you know, professional or a space for disabled people, actors or disabled performers that potentially I guess the subject matter could have nothing to do with disability um, I don't know whether all your, your all, all the content is disability focused I mean it kind of uh, it's interesting whether it's kind of you're there as a disabled performer but in fact actually whatever the, the narrative or the story that you're trying to tell um, you know isn't an in your face disability specific thing so um, yeah, so uh, yeah, has it's, that it's, happened or is it mainly again the, been again because it's been the theme generally has been disability in, in the different ways it's been construed? I think for me my material is pretty much about disability most of the time. But, I mean, my stuff is really varied from talking about, you know, the beauties of stump fucking through to death, love and everything in between. But this, for me, there's no doubt that disability is funny. It's an emotional draw card and it's something that can be... It's sort of like if we go out on stage, we are going out with 150% of what you, your two-limbed, ordinary-ish act a person walks out with. And some of that's a downer in that I walk out and I can see sometimes audiences are looking at me and they're thinking, oh, my God, is this meant to be funny or not? Is this serious or not? Oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. And, 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 um, and, and others, you know, just, you know, take me as, as I am. But for all of us, I think, I'm just remembering a few pieces where disability wasn't relevant, um, a person talking about the breakup of a, a love affair and for that, He's, I don't think he's, he's, I mean, he's obviously disabled, that particular performer, but there was nothing about this yeah. in that particular piece. And I think, though, for a lot of us, I'm thinking now of our favourite stand-up comedian, uh, a lovely lady called Natalie. She takes events in her life that are just ordinary-ish kind of events that gives them a disability twist. Yeah. So you sort of go in on her story as you might about, you know, the day you went to the supermarket or whatever. But then the twist will happen because her disability complicates this story. And, and, that, and, that, and that makes sense because, I mean, the fact is I mean, we, we're thoroughly in, um, embodied and we're saturated with disability. So, as you say, there will be that kind of dis disability twist, which I guess some... Um, you know, leads me on to uh, 
an issue because it is an unfamiliar um, path to take and you, you guys really are pioneers. Um, is uh, the, the notion of disability and I guess the expressive body and um, I'm wondering what given generally and you talked about your early you know school theatre experiences but um, as performers um, what kind of frame of mind you you need to kind of get yourself into because um, you know uh, you know often what people with disabilities um, experience is this kind of internalized ableism you know which um, which I always talk about is that kind of permanent sense of failure. It's like this little tape, tape recorder in the back of the head that kind of, you know, despite achievements, you're kind of waiting to kind of fall over the cliff edge at some stage. And, it's, mm. and you know, it's absence of role models and mentors, but also it's, it's kind of, as you've already rightfully said, the kind of unfamiliarity of the kind of visualness of... Um, um, the disabled expressive body and um, and as a performer you're right in the middle of that and um, I guess as each time you you, you you don't know who your audience is you you're not sure how they're going to react and I imagine every performance is different mm -hmm. even though you know obviously the script might be the same but every performance is different and you um so what didn't there's lots of things going on confidence mm -hmm. issues um can you speak a little bit about that the kind of frame of and how Disability performance, you know, people talk about, for example, disabled sport as uh, like with the Paralympics coming up as being good for people who've been Paralympians talk about it, you know, um, contributing to the change in the sense of self because of the way you're exercising your bodies. And I'm wondering in terms of disability performance, um, what kind of processes, you know, do you need to engage with to tackle that internalised ableism that is so deep-seated? It, it's a real. It's a really good point. It does take guts to get up there on the stage. There's no doubt about it. But then, I mean, I, I just remind, um, probably a month ago when we were having our first meeting of the for the next shows, there was a, a very young woman there, um, another wheelchair user, really sweet. You know, she's probably only about nineteen or so. And she'd been watching a bit of us rehearsing and playing with stuff and she just sort of ambled up to me and said, oh, I don't know how you can get up there. You know, I'd really love to get up there. And I said, well, for me, disability is a performative life. I mean, if you think about, because uh, I was always different. So as a, as a baby, um, an 18 month old, I had to perform in front of hateful people I loathed. I'm talking medicos and so forth. Yes, that's right. And I had to find the persona that would take me through this and let me survive. And so for, from very, very young, I learned the various layers that you put on to deal with the public. And so I was saying to this young woman, I was saying every day, you layer up a persona to go out and face the world and be brave, not cry if people say weird shit to you um, and to be able to bounce back off that and keep going. And that, that is performance. And she was like, oh. And I was saying, yes, look, we can all tap into this. Now, obviously, it's more complicated than that because, you know, the, the same persona I go to talk to my, you know, medical people in is not the same one that I go up on stage to do. But it's in there. It's in that long held practice of facing the world knowing I'm different, knowing I'm going to cop stairs, but sailing on anyway because I have to. Yeah. So um, that's the sort of thing I, I tell people, but I think it's what we're used to in terms of, you know, disability performance is like pa Peter Vilecki, might not have his name quite right, but the guy who does those inspirational raves. Yeah. I've seen it. Because he, he, um, he's quite limbless and he kind of clonks over yeah. and he, he gets oh, up yeah. and everyone cheers. He has and one where he flings a phone around and, you know, it's just how many different ways you can use a telephone without limbs, yeah. And so we're used to that being the style, that I'm here, I have survived yeah. and that that's about as high as it gets. And so what takes courage then, because it's easy, well, I think it's easy to get up on stage and go, hi, I'm Kath Duncan, I was born this, 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 that. Yeah, exactly. Know. Show and tell. That is <laughs> very easy. What is difficult is to take risks. So to go into character, 
to tell a story that's not yours to be a mean and nasty person up there because that's the other pressure on disabled people that it's okay for me to go up on stage as long as I'm very loving, yeah. kind and compassionate, that's okay. But to go up there and be spiteful and bitter and hateful, like to be a bitchy character, that is what takes guts. And so I'm kind of just, because I feel like I'm a baby in this because it kind of like I started here and then there was like this 30 year gap and now I've started again. So I'm playing a lot more with character these days, but say the last, last year, a year ago, a series of shows, I came up with this character called um, Shirley McBogan, who's the non-disabled CEO of the First Step Disability Employment Agency. And she is, all that I despise. And I, you know, did the hat, the outfit, and, da, 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 da. and I'm doing her, and she's like totally a bugger. Oh, we're all disabled on the inside, aren't we, darlings? And those are the, that sort of rhetoric which I was pulling on. We're actually used to being the story. And so doing that character, it was hilarious to look out on the audience and see some people who were non disabled looking at me and the horror because they didn't know whether I was paying homage to a lovely lady who ran this service or whether it was a joke. So that's the courage bit, to step outside of what we're allowed supposed to do. Yeah, and I think you're right. I think it's the courage bit. But the other thing about this, and and I I love the idea that we already uh, are living within a matrix of performance anyway, and you're right. I mean, because uh, I think particularly for those of us with visible impairments, um, I mean, the whole notion of being stared at and, you know, and... um, uh, you know, I, I can remember recently um, being in a situation where I went out to dinner and um, I use a wheelchair, but I can get out of the chair and, you know, I could see this whole family watching. And so, you know, I can be being with a friend of mine and we kind of decided to play a trick and kind of, a, you know, to kind of one minute be in the chair and then kind of walk around and, you know, and uh, I guess being being mindful that they were watching and think, okay, well, if you're going to watch, we're going to give you something to, to watch about there. But it seems like the big difference is control. Um, yeah, what yeah. you're talking about here and fashioning different nuances and um, and I guess you've, it's interesting with the audience. Um, what kind of, I mean, you've done quite a few um, shows now. Um, can you, if, if, if we're going to put a sociologist hat on here, um, can, can you talk to me a little bit about the profile of your audiences? Has it changed over time? Can you tell us a little bit about, I mean, obviously there's no one audience, there's a variety, but can you tell us a little bit about who those people are? And, um, and do you get to speak to them afterwards to find out why they came yes. and all this sort of thing? Yes. Quite, quite often the audience members come up to us afterwards and there's that, that's, those sort of reactions are, are quite broad. Um, so when we started uh, at Hares and Hyenas, now they have a kind of an audience, a very loyal audience of, you know, quite a few hundred people that, you know, choose between the different events to have on at any one time. So in the beginning, our audience was predominantly queer and pre- predominantly knew of us or knew of yeah. the branding of that particular bookshop, knew what they would get, you know, as a performance space. What we found, though, and this is interesting, after I think about a year, and so I was now producing solo at that time, we started to get inquiries from non-queer disabled people who wanted to work with us, who said there's nowhere for us to perform. And so we debated it and re- realised that we we were holding on, uh, we were determined to hold on to the disabled and deaf identity kind of thing, but that we were prepared to give ground on queer, queer friendly. And in a similar way, I guess, as we drew in then, you know, unqueer or queer friendly people, our audiences started to expand as well. Mm. At any one time, this thing I find really interesting, because we're so weird and unusual and our material is weird and unusual, yeah. at any one time about 30% of our audience have never seen us before. Yeah. And I find that really interesting. They've gone through the listings of what's on and they've gone, oh, my God, look at this, look at this weird thing. This looks interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like I've never been to one of them. And so that, that's been another real education for me. It, it, it's kind of like a... Uh, it's kind of like killing my own internalised ableism to see all these differences as being real strengths for attracting audiences, attracting funding. The people would actually want to come and come and see you. Yes. <laughs> from, from the mainstream, from, yeah. Now, I have to say, so here we are, a show is over, 
and people come up. And so there's a minority of people who come up in tears and say, I've never seen anything like this. How amazing, how wonderful you are. And, of course, I'm very nice to those people. But they're reacting from that base of, oh, isn't it remarkable this disabled people can do anything? Yep. Oh, my God. <laughs> so you've got that as one reaction. And then you've got that kind of, wow, you know, that this is, this is really interesting material kind of thing. And then you've got people who know us already and to, you know, always appreciate and, you know, support the shows. And then I guess you've got people who want to get involved. And so it's a very active audience, I have yeah, to say. Yeah. And what age range, Kath, are they? Are they a younger crowd or uh, do you find it's a diverse crowd age-wise? It kind of changes because the... I think we're still experimenting with how to publicise, like how and where to publicise. So for these next shows, I'm trying another method of publish publicising. We're sort of in a position now where we, we need to make um, money from ticket sales, but we've still got a bit of room to experiment there. So um, I think the, um, for us, the audience nexus with our performer kind of you know that relationship is always in flux i mean we one time at a show i wasn't actually involved in two years ago i was out the back uh, with the band we had a three-piece band at the time <laughs> this is down at um the spiegel tent down in uh, collingwood and uh, suddenly, to my horror, I see approaching us what looks like Dick and Dora Decent and the baby Jesus and baby Jesus' sister. Mm -hmm. towards us. And I look at them and I think, oh, there must be a church behind the Spiegel tent they're headed to. But no, they're heading into our performance. And I said, oh, my God, this is a disaster. And sure enough, they left during the first act and it was a little embarrassing. So the audience is always over 18. And yeah. we put that really clear in our um, promotional material because most of the stuff we do little out there, you know, and, and some less so. But um, so you've got this age range. I would say you're right that the bulk of our audience tend to, tend to be between, you know, 20 and 35. Right. And these are the young folk. And we always keep our tickets cheap for it to be accessible. So that's the bulk of our audience. And then you've got sort of older people. Um, some of those people get a bit shocked. Uh, we were doing um, sort of like a pop-up fake book signing, I think I haven't got my book here, it's hilarious, but anyway, fake book signing, where we've all written these inspirational stories that were all really twisted and weird. Yeah, yeah. And doing it in the middle of Fed Square and I'm, I've done my piece and I sort of was standing back and this lady approached me and you sort of get a bit of a sixth sense about this. She approached me and I just thought, uh-oh, you know, and she goes, oh, hello. She goes, my daughter's disabled and um, it's just so lovely to see you people out. And unfortunately, I knew that the next guy to get up, his piece was all, his book cover was all about masturbation. And I was just, I was just, it was like, you know, waiting for a bomb to go off and just sort of standing there going, lovely, thank you so much, you know, whatever. And then, you know, this guy gets up and I just, you know, you just sort of feel the horror mounting and then the withdrawal happening. So it's, it's, quite, it's because we're disabled, because our material is a bit edgy, you get quite polarised audience response. Yeah. And I just actually leads me to, I guess, uh, uh, what I was thinking when you were talking. Have you had, uh, I mean, yes, it's advertisers over 18, but have you had uh, people walk out, um, uh, noticeably walk out in the over the years or, um, I think or had, had, had nasty emails or um, I'm just interested in terms of people who are very threatened uh, and how people respond because, I mean, obviously one thing about going to a performance about anything, um, if you're challenged and, you know, you go away and it... Um, maybe changes your way of seeing the world or ch changes a way about seeing how people differ from yourself live, that's great. I mean, that's what you want to happen. But, um, uh, you know, sometimes their reaction to something that's unfamiliar or scary or makes people vulnerable or confront their own values and the way they relate um, can actually provoke hostility. And I'm just wondering whether there has been an experience um, uh, you know, either with the audiences communicating with you by email or indeed getting up and standing up or maybe even yelling out expletives. I don't know whether that's happened in any of your performances. No, it hasn't. And I think there's a lot in there about your beginnings because our, our patronage, our support from the Hares and Hyenas boys who put on, my God, some, um, I, I can't even go there, just some totally out there mm. stuff gets on there. So because that's where we started, even though we've changed venues as well along the way, 
um, but still kept our roots at hares and hyenas, because we started with them and their audience is actually quite sophisticated, I'm just, I don't think, I don't think we've ever, except for Dick and Dora Decent and the baby Jesus, I don't think there's ever been another walkout. I've never had anyone complain about the material, its level of obscenity. I remember once a show um, that I wasn't performing at, um, I was outside, here's and Hainas, they sort of have little coffee tables there, and a wheelchair-using guy and his maybe personal assistant or whatever came out and he was a bit like, oh, 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 that's shocking. And i uh, sorry, I don't remember what the performance was. That yeah. it, I'm not recalling that. But I remember um, seeing that thing, oh, fabulous, you know, and going up to him and going, oh, hi, you know, I'm, I'm a producer, so like, do you have a problem? And oh, I wish I could remember what he was reacting to, but I don't. Mm. But he was, he was a little bit shocked. And, you know, you, you, I think as a disabled person, because we're used to assessing danger really quickly, you can sort of assess something. And there was a few things that went through my mind. Sheltered background, maybe parental, you know, care home or whatever. And maybe not terribly experienced with, the range of sexualities. Um, off the top of my head, that piece he was probably reacting to was maybe a gay piece and gay male piece with some, you know, dildo use or whatever or penises or, or whatever. That's my guess. Yeah, yeah. Reacting to that. In that unfortunate uh, situation you can get among some disabled people where we'll accept disability pride but, like, all you queer people just make us look bad. You yeah. know what I mean? It's just yeah. a thing that lurks. Um, I think I think you're right, and uh, I mean one of the strengths of Quipping's, um, you know, which unfortunately coming from Queensland, I haven't had a chance to see you guys. I look forward to you travelling, taking a road show around the country. Oh, would the, oh I love that. Which would be amazing. But I mean, from what you were saying, and certainly being, you know, observing what you've been doing over time, is I mean, it, it's the variety um, is the strength, and as you say, people are at, at different places, um, you know, within their kind of. Um, um, understanding of disability but also the integration of disability with a sense of self. I mean, um, is an ableism now, I mean, one of the really interesting things about the word is ableism um, is kind of like the, the new racism in terms of linguistic parlance, but I um, kind of often wonder, it gets used in so many different ways. Um, and I must say in some ways that are a bit disturbing in, in some sense because um, uh, we know that um, the concept of ableism as a practice and its um, power relationships and then how how it um, you know privileges certain people in the community. I mean, the, uh, unpacking even what ableist privilege is, is a, would be a really interesting performance space. And it sounds like you um, uh, touched upon that with your employment uh, service manager. <laughs> um, but but um, you know, is um, is ableism a kind of a theme that is um, has been discussed or performed? Um, within any, any of the shows, um, and and I'm, and and I guess that um, why I'm asking this is because really, I mean, you, you really are talking about disability performance and maybe disability humour as is, is, is an unfamiliar territory. I think the I, I actually think ableism is a complicated process to people. I mean, one of my you know, big regrets really or the a disappointment I have in general um, in Australia is the the kind of siloing or, or whatever you call it, of disability theory and disability studies off over there in the realm of academics and policy makers and so forth. And here um, in the kind of the maelstrom of, you know, performers and, and so forth that, that we draw from, um, people will have heard of the social model and regard the social model as being like, you know, the Bible handed down on Mount What's-Name. And, um, however, ableism is, I think, another step of complexity that I have found there to be a lack of analysis by just your average disabled person. So in the middle of all that floats a concept that, that we do draw on of disability pride. Yes. So quite often we're coming from this, we are this solidarity bunch. We are together in this. And I don't think there's been much analysis of outside of our bubble, you know, and how we could use that creatively. Like this is like, you know, you realise you've still got creative goals? Yeah, yeah. I'd like to make ableism funny because through comedy you can really cut 
you know, much more than if I stood up there and did just a straight piece about. I, I, I agree. I agree because there's so many strands and, you know, ableism is an essentially relational concept anyway. It happens in, in the interaction between people, um, you know, in the interaction with our own selves and, and, and the broader environment. So it's got these really complex strands. And, um, you know, for example, uh, looking at ableist privilege, I mean, wow, I mean, all sorts of places you can take with from the point of view of comedy, um, notions of ableism and disgust, um, and, and I guess the other side of it is uh, is the kind of um, ableist sentiments that come up with um, disability pride, you know, disability desire. Um, I mean, I'm just thinking again. This is probably a source for another interview, but even some of the kind of politics and the the this, uh, the delicate sensibilities around the trans ableist movement, for example, you know. Um, oh, yeah. Kind of, just for our audience, people who basically it's called self-demand disability, people who um, identify as able-bodied but um, would like to become disabled because they feel incomplete because they're able-bodied. So, I mean, there's all there are all these kind of um, spectrums there, um, you know, that you can 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 unpack. But um, also, I guess um, is yeah, looking at some of the kind of contradictions with an ableism itself, the kind of, the um, even some of the play around purple person first language, mm -hmm. uh, the kind mm -hmm. of separation mm -hmm. of uh, one's identities from one's, one's body, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know. And um, I was thinking about this the other day because um, uh, the university that I'm associated with had a, had a, um, um, a marketing campaign on the web and uh, there was a person who had won the alumni of the year award a person in a wheelchair and the press release talked about the person being confined to a wheelchair and I'm like, oh, God. it's 2016 but you know you could but um it's interesting the notion of a wheelchair as confinement or assistive yeah. devices confinement I mean there's all sorts of kind of plays that you could could have in this I mean what is actually being confined here who is confined? You know, I can see myself. Uh, maybe there's um, a kind of hidden performer inside myself as I'm sort of talking here because you can really do some interesting kind of um, slapstick around this. Oh, I, I think you're a great performer. I think you're one of the best lecturers I've ever seen perform up there. Not just with what you bring to it with your sort of embodiment, but also all the multimedia displays that you do. I mean, you're very... Yeah. All performing yourself. I, I just a, a few things stood out um, in that in that point. I think I think one of the complications of looking at say a word like privilege, and this is what I found within you know disability movements, it's really difficult to talk to someone who struggles to get up out of bed and so forth and so on about their white privilege or their middle class privilege when all they're aware of is that their life is hard. Exactly. And, it's, it's a really complicated issue for a lot of disabled people to get their heads around relative privilege and we don't want to play the oppression Olympics either. Yeah. So I think disabled people float in a very uncomfortable relationship to notions of privilege and the hierarchies that operate upon us all as disabled people. We were all brought up with ableism. We were well, all... That's right, ableism, look, you know, and as I say in my own work, it relies on a, a ranking, a system of differentiation. Mm -hmm. Um, that we regard as being normal. Yep, yep. a system of deferral. This says another deferral thing is um, always that you know you're different from that. And uh, yeah, we know about the hierarchy of suffering, you know, and um, that terrible kind of ethical nuance of stop whinging. There's always somebody worse yes. off than you. You know, as a very little girl, I was put into main uh, into the special ed system when I was three. And what I learned was that, oh, dear, I've got a call coming in. Damn it. I'm just going to have to reject the call. Okay, so as a little girl, it was like being in jail. And I, where I came from with my family, so it's a day school, you know, but where I came from with my family was this ever-expansive, bushy place in Sydney's southern suburbs. And I knew I had to escape, even as a very tiny tot, and I worked out really quickly the way to do it, and I can't say this was conscious, was that around me were kids with all types of impairments. And I knew that if I learnt to read, if I um, uh, marked myself as different from these other guys, that I would get out of there. And so at the age of four, I was saying, I am not like these. I am not like these others, and it worked. Yeah, like that's that's 
what I regarded as being normal and more than just normal is survival yeah. was to actually get out of jail was to adopt abler standards that then dictated the next sort of 20 years of my life until I started to get more educated. Yeah. And that's a really important point that you've actually made, Pat, uh, Kath, is that, that um, I mean, I think that's another whole conversation itself, the kind of, um, you know, the way in which we kind of get engaged in disability disavow and othering from other disabled people to, uh, and there's so much pressure to do that. Um, I mean, social role valorisation theory, normalisation theory, talks about kind of minimising the deviancies, you know, and um, not hanging out with other um, um, so-called deviant people that might magnify, um, you know, devaluation. Um, I just thought, look, if we probably need to close it off fairly soon, but just to kind of finish on the uh, your thoughts on the issue of shock, because I think, um, and disturb, because, uh, again, I guess going full circle here about um, what the purpose of sh shock is and disturbing, because um, sometimes, I mean, the shock of disability um, can be a form of titillation. I mean, um, uh, and I guess the whole kind of disability voyeurism um, that, that, that comes into that. But I guess um, to get a sense of what, what your thoughts are on about, um, uh, you know, the purpose of disturbing and, and that sense of kind of shock. What is the shock? And is the shock aimed at some kind of um, internal transformation for your audience? There's a big one to have our last question. <laughs> I think it's definitely an internal transformation for the performer, you know, like to be able to get up there and talk about, I remember just one, I hope this doesn't shock the audience, just, just one small piece I delivered once was about the, the death of my beloved ex-partner and the story I invented was that at her funeral I got a moment alone with her and fisted her corpse. Now I know that's a terrible, you know what I mean, like that's shocking, right? But I tried to turn it into poetry and blah, 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 blah. And, and it really got a huge applause. And to be honest, I don't think I really considered what the meaning of that was, what the meaning of what I was doing was. I think what I wanted to do was just to really make people focus on me, on this story. So, you know, I'd love to be able to say, I'm there so that the audience can really change their minds about disability. To me, that's the icing on the cake. Mm -hmm. If that, do you, do you think some process you... going on of that. Yeah, but do you think really, performers um, are responsible? And, and, Sorry. And, and this is just the way I see it too. It's, you'd probably get a different answer talking across mm. the clippings. My main concern is for us to internally transform ourselves from being people with you know, I, I would even say it's myself relatively limited lives because of our impairments. Yeah. If someone who can stretch and soar, reveal what they choose to reveal. So it's not like I'm Kath Duncan and I must tell you the story of my life or you won't listen. It's not about that. It's about being the, the artists, the performers that we want to be in public and getting people to pay for it. I mean, mm. that is really powerful. Oddly, people do come up to me um, afterwards and we'll say things like, wow, you know, that's really shifted, you know, my thinking about, you know, disabled people and, and what you guys can do. And I think that is a really important part of what we do. But it's not my major drive. I'd like to think it was a side product or whatever. But my major drive is for us to have careers and aspirations, expectations of being performers, of having public lives, having some control over our public lives and being able to tell the stories we want to tell. Yeah. So I think that's, uh, look, I, I get a sense of that. It's interesting, um, the example that you used, and I guess uh, with a, the benefit of hindsight and reflection, and obviously as you um, are now developing other kinds of skits and things, that, do, I mean, and, uh, and I'm not necessarily directing this question to you, but just more generally in terms of reflection on the other performances you, 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 you know, you're participating in. Do you, do you think um, there is some ethical responsibility to... Um, to look at maybe thinking about, well, what's the meaning of something that I want to do? Um, uh, given that um, performances um, and their symbolism and their representations are so powerful, I mean, they want, there is an expression that says the, the, um, the singer, the musician, the performer, often the, the, the discourses that come out of it are far more powerful than the text 
you know it's uh, the arts have always often um, spoken and said things where um, you know the politicians haven't and the general community hasn't and um, the writers haven't you know I guess the, the arts being at the, the, the vanguard of cultural change in, in many ways so I'm just wondering um, uh, given that big, bigger, broader environment that we've been talking about today, but whether it is worth, um, uh, you know, as, as, at that almost that second stage of development, to is there a responsibility to, refl to reflect upon the meaning? What do we want to um, um, taking into account all those things you say? It's about your experience as the, the performer as well, but you are delivering a product, to put it rather crudely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's. I think that is the next kind of stage of consideration. I mean, I, I find myself back being Quipping's producer, which means, you know, I raise money, I do the public profile stuff, I gather the performers together, I make sure it works, I keep everyone safe. And somewhere in there I have been concerned at times about the effect of people telling stories, whether it's their stories or somebody else's, on themselves and the effect of those stories on the audience and where those things lead. Because, you know, there's no doubt that the performers make themselves vulnerable up there, whether they whether their piece is about them or nothing or, you know, something completely, you know, disconnected from it. And, and what is, are we pushing, you know, the disability you know, story forward or are we, you know, hanging in the freak shows? I love freak shows. My dream job is to be with a freak show. But I know that's not the usual run for what performers want to do. So, you know, what are we achieving? What is the bigger picture? And, you know, I don't have an answer for that at the moment. There's something in the arts, though, that sort of drives itself. I, I always faked theory at university. I've been to a few unis now and faked it all until I got to Southern Cross Uni in Lismore and a, a well-known academic these days, Jerry Goggin, introduced me to disability theory and by the arts. And so I can't remember the name of the book, but it was a, an American book and um, the Americans sort of led the sort of disability studies on humanities kind of movement back then. And that was how I finally understood some notions about theory, about disability, about embodiment via arts critique from disabled scholars. So I could see that for me it was a really powerful route in to a sort of a sense of myself I'd never had before. And, and for me, that's still a driving force that, to a certain extent, no offence, you know, bugger the ethics, make the art, make it powerful, get audiences in, and then see what happens. <laughs> you know, I mean, I know that's probably irresponsible, but at least I'm admitting it. You know, <laughs> the thing is, I think, to get the shows happening, that we all enjoy ourselves, that we have a balance of views across the shows. What happens next? You know, maybe somebody else is going to write that story. Yeah, well, I think you've uh, you've raised an issue. I mean, what we you you're the, sort of, you're the pioneers. We're doing quippings, and hopefully, what will come out of this is some multiple spaces and with some you know a variety of visions. So, Kath, thank you for the opportunity to have this uh, amazing conversation today. Um, and you know, we've covered a whole range of areas, and no doubt, you know, it'll be great to have the opportunity maybe. Uh, you know, in a year's time with uh, more experiences um, under your belt and uh, more reflections to um, to follow up the issue. So thank you very much again for uh, speaking with us today. Oh, it's my pleasure, Fiona. Always a delight. Thank you.